So it finally happened. After years and years of doing all of your math homework in pencil, or worse, pen, uh, and handing it in to your uh, teachers and your professors and then getting it back with more pen on it, um, you've finally been asked to write something mathematically using a computer, actually typing it up. How do I do this? There's notation, there's integral signs, there's summations. What am I going to do with all this stuff? How do I make it look right? Well, that's what the next couple of videos are about. If you want to typeset mathematics, rule number one, and this goes no matter what choices you make over the next couple of videos, rule number one is to always write the math that you'd want to read. Mathematical writing is challenging. That's because mathematical reading is challenging. That's because the conventions of our field often inform a very terse style of writing where we don't use a very large number of words to represent a lot of thoughts. Um, and so getting used to that form of expression and the style conventions that surround it are what we'll do in this video. And the next couple of videos, we'll look at a little bit more of the how-to of how to actually put the mathematical word down to paper. So first, let's take a look at a mathematical paper and pull out of it some of the style conventions, some of the ways that mathematicians tend to write that make their writing kind of look similar to one another. Uh, what's the form of it and what's the function of it? So if you call up Central Casting in Hollywood and ask them to cast a mathematical article, this, chances are, is what it'll look like. So this is an article that I just pulled off of the web uh, as an example of what a lot of mathematical writing tends to look like. It's very short. Uh, it goes over some ideas in analysis and algebra, a little bit high level, so I wouldn't recommend trying to read this paper as an undergraduate. Um, but we're going to look at it real quickly just to pull out some of what makes mathematical writing look like mathematical writing. And these style conventions are ways that mathematicians communicate with one another in subtext. It's a way to help us to get more quickly to the understanding of these papers without getting distracted by uh, sort of elements of form and style and function. So the first observation that I make looking through this writing here uh, is that anything which is mathematical, any notation that I see being used here, is all set in a particular collection combination of fonts and styles that make it stand apart from the rest of the text. For example, right here, the letter F, which is representing a function in this argument. Um, this letter F is typeset in italics, and all the text around it is not. Same thing with this A, that's a variable. Um, but then this bold-faced R for the real numbers is not. Um, likewise, the symbols that make up these equations have a healthy amount of breathing room around them. Um, so there's a, sort of a collection of, of style choices that mathematicians make when they typeset any bit of mathematics uh, that make it easier to read and help to help your brain to process it. So I call this Math Fonts Matter. And it's a set of three principles. The first, again, is that all of your variables need to be set in italics. That goes whether the variables represent a number or a group or a set or anything. They should all be typeset in italics. This F, this A, DX over here. Any letter that you use in a mathematical equation or expression should always be typeset in italics. But everything else that includes the numbers, the operators, the plus signs, the equal signs, um, the, the real number sets, all that stuff. All the rest of it should not be in italics. So this plus here, for example, is not in italics. Uh, if there's a number in an equation later on, that that number should also not be typeset in italics. Also, notice that the names of functions and mathematical operations like infimum here, interior there, um, those are generally not typeset in italics either. It's what makes them stand apart from the variables and the other italics things that are around them. And finally, all of the operators should have room to breathe. We don't want to sandwich this plus sign so close together with the stuff around it that it can't clearly be seen that there's two things being added. So there's a spacing element in here as well. If this sounds like a lot to keep in mind and at once, that's because it is. Fortunately, the mathematical typesetting systems that we're going to look at in the next video already know all of these conventions about how math fonts matter. And so the good news is you won't have to remember all these things separately. As long as you remember to format your math as math, then the software will do the rest of this formatting for you. So that's the good news, is that you don't have to remember these things all in isolation. Secondly, you'll notice that math notation shows up in two different ways, two different styles inside of mathematical writing. On the one hand, you'll see some mathematics happening right inside of the sentence uh, that it's being written in. We call this inline mathematics. And generally, when you put mathematics inside of a sentence right inside of your writing, just lives within the paragraph, you want to keep it pretty short and sweet. 
So just naming a variable uh, or naming a very short thing like O belongs to the set O, that kind of stuff. Um, really short stuff you can make live inside of a paragraph. But longer stuff, like this long series of equations, for example, lives on its own in a separate line. We call that displayed mathematics. And it's always centered in the middle of a line with some generous amount of white space both above and below it. Um, this can be the case if there's a particularly important observation to make, or more often, when there's a particularly long expression uh, that you have to write down, or an equation. Generally, most equations live on a line by themselves, centered in the display math kind of environment. And so, point number two about mathematical writing is that short expressions can live inside of paragraphs, whereas longer expressions, or almost anything with an equal sign in it, should really live in a display environment, on a line, by itself, with some breathing space above it and below it, and centered. We call that display math. Convention number three that makes mathematical writing special is what you'll notice this author doing. In the, at the beginning of a number of these paragraphs, there's a very clear sort of bold-faced statement that this is what this paragraph is. This paragraph is describing the statement of a theorem. Uh, this sentence here is setting up a proof. It's beginning a proof that, notice, it doesn't end here. It actually sort of continues into a new lemma, and then the proof of that lemma. So mathematical authors use this, what we call sectioning, uh, at the beginning of paragraphs to clearly state sort of what is the function of this paragraph or this sentence within the larger context of the paper that I'm writing. So if you're stating a theorem, say that right up front at the beginning of the sentence. If you're beginning a proof, say the word proof up here at the beginning of the sentence and set it in boldface. That way the reader knows exactly what the function of the thing you're about to read is. Uh, so this sort of sectioning convention is another thing that makes mathematical writing sort of unique. So use clear sectioning to organize your writing and put those section names like lemma 1, proof, and so forth, put them in boldface right up front at the beginning of your paragraph. That way again the reader knows what the function of this paragraph is going to be. Clear sectioning really sets good mathematical writing apart from great mathematical writing as far as the clarity with which the reader is able to access the ideas that are there in the larger context of the paper. The last thing to notice about mathematical writing conventions is how short the paragraphs are. Um, these paragraphs are frequently broken up by display math, and even when there's not mathematics notation in them, the paragraphs are still usually only two or three sentences long. And one of the things I most commonly see with novice mathematical writers is that they don't use paragraph breaks enough. But paragraph breaks are a really useful way to signal to the reader what sentences are part of the same idea and what sentences are the beginning of a new idea. And getting that rhythm down as a reader is really the key to understanding especially intricate mathematical arguments. So use more paragraph breaks than you think you need. Keep your paragraphs shorter than you think they ought to be. Short paragraphs that are spaced apart, so they have room to breathe above them and below them, that's really the hallmark of, of conventional mathematical writing. And that's very different from the kind of paragraph writing that you're probably used to doing with essays and other courses and so forth. Um, short paragraphs are a key tool that journalists use, for example, in newspaper articles um, to help the reader to more carefully grasp the argument that they're trying to make. They present the argument in these shorter bite-sized pieces. Uh, and paragraphs of one and two sentences are not uncommon in journalism. They're also not uncommon in mathematical writing either. So those are the style conventions that I want us to think about in our mathematical writing. And the next step then is to talk about the how-to. So how do you actually sit down at a computer and make one of these beautiful mathematical papers? What I want to do is give you a choice of two different systems uh, to look at. The first is one you probably already are familiar with, Microsoft Word. There are professional mathematicians that do most of their work inside of Word. It's a word processor that most people uh, sort of develop proficiency with at some point. Um, and depending on where you're going with your math degree after you graduate, um, you might be in an environment in the workplace where people are still mostly using Microsoft Word. Um, thinking, for example, in the K-12 uh, education setting, if you're going to be a teacher, probably a lot of your teacher colleagues are using Word uh, to typeset their mathematical stuff. Um, on the other hand, there's a system called LaTeX, L-A-T-E-X. Um, and LaTeX is the system used for the professional generation of, of mathematics, science, and engineering papers. Uh, so the paper we were looking at in this video, that was developed using the LaTeX environment. So if your trajectory is taking you more towards a research and development and academia sort of path, you may find yourself in an environment where most of your colleagues and your collaborators are using LaTeX. LaTeX is really pretty, but there's a bit more of a learning curve, which is maybe worth it to you if that's the direction that you're headed with your degree. 
So make your decision. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can either click the, the video next to watch the Microsoft Word presentation or the one in LaTeX, uh, and we'll go forward and look at the how-tos from here.